A good evening, everyone. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to be covering these three very small topics of art, environment and business uh, and trying to do that in 30 minutes. So I will dive straight in. Uh, we are all uh, probably aware of this little thing uh, called coronavirus and COVID-19, which has been uh, challenging us, let's say, for the last nine months or so. Uh, and it's interesting because the world in many ways will never be uh, the same as it was before uh, this little adventure. If you go back to last year, uh, offering free hugs on the street would have made you an empathetic human being, uh, a lovely person to be around. In 2020, it makes you look like a sociopath. So, so many of the rules of engagement have been rewritten um, over the last uh, nine months or so. But also, this is a foreseeable challenge. Uh, as astronomer Royal Martin Rees said in 2015, he said, our interconnected world is so vulnerable that our hospitals uh, and health service would be overwhelmed even when the mortality rate was a fraction of 1% uh, and how right he was. So he was saying this five years ago uh, and equally the All England Lord Tennis Club at Wimbledon uh, had been quite merrily paying a £1 million a month, or uh, £1 million a year insurance against a pandemic and its impacts, which had just happily paid out uh, a £100 million dividend to compensate for the lack of the TS tournament. So we could see this coming in many ways. And I think uh, following up from what we were saying in the introduction, this is the apocalypse, and uh, not in terms of the end of the world, but perhaps the end of the world as we knew it. Uh, and the full derivation of that word apocalypse, which is the pulling back of the veil, the revealing, the exposure of the pipework underneath, the stuff uh, that's really going on under the surface has all been thrown into stark and illuminated light uh, by the events of the last uh, nine months. Uh, I talk about this a lot with my colleague Dougal Hine in a podcast we do called The Great Humbling, which asks the question, well, what would happen if we embraced the challenges we face with a degree of humility? What happens if we were to take this in a very grounded way to bring ourselves literally back to earth? Um, and those conversations have been uh, amazing because it's in stark contrast, if you like, to the, the kind of hubris and the arrogance of trying to get through this without learning anything. Because let's face it, this cartoon by Tom Toro from The New Yorker with the ragged trousered businessman saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. It is awkwardly funny because it's at least partly true. So we are faced with a challenge of having to redefine what prosperity means beyond simple economic growth into a notion of genuine flourishing and thriving. Uh, and that, if you like, is where these worlds all come together, the worlds of art uh, and climate and enterprise. Because we're very good as human beings at the laws of unintended consequences. Uh, I always use this example, which is the invention of the tin can, which is a brilliant um, innovation in terms of the storage, preservation and transportation of perishable foodstuffs. Uh, sadly, it took 38 years, though, between the invention of the tin can and the invention of the can opener. So even with a brilliant, well-intended innovation, we often have 38 years of uh, an interim period where people were opening these things with hammers and chisels and knives and lacerating themselves horrifically in, in the process. And so what we have to try and do is to stretch the imagination of the possible, which is what uh, I also do in my other podcast with uh, comedian John Richardson and fellow reluctant futurist Mark Stevenson, because we say... Being a futurist is not about predicting and analyzing the trends to, to try and uh, soothsay where we might be headed. But the job of a futurist is to stretch that imagination of the possibility, which is where the role of art and culture is absolutely critical. Because we also know, and thankfully we might hopefully be saying uh, goodbye to he who shall not be named in the White House, um, if he can ever concede the election and not have to be removed from the premises uh, by the armed forces. But I, I love this image because I think it sums up so many of the tensions we're currently trying to traverse, which is uh, an intergenerational tension uh, between Greta Thunberg here uh, and Donald, uh, and also a gender tension and also a worldview tension about the way we see the way the planet works. Because small things can make a difference. Uh, we're not just in the kind of territory of being left alone in a room with a mosquito. Uh, we're here, whoever said one person can't change a world never ate an undercooked bat which we might be regretting uh, in hindsight. 
Uh, and we've alluded to the fact that this is not a drill and the role of Extinction Rebellion in bringing um, the climate emergency onto the agenda. Uh, and I think for me, the tipping point really began to happen as someone who'd worked on climate change for 20 years uh, was the Australian fires, where the scale of those fires, when an area the size of Austria burnt, a billion animals were killed, thousands of homes were destroyed, hundreds of people uh, displaced from their homes in the teeth of these fires. And I remember seeing a comment on Facebook where someone saying, look, it's not climate change, it's just heat and drought and fires. So you can try and unpick the cognitive dissonance uh, behind that one phrase. There's probably a PhD in it. Equally, our political leadership has been found somewhat wanting. This is Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, standing up in the Australian Parliament saying, this is coal, don't be afraid, don't be scared. Uh, but in actual fact, we really should be, because what we're seeing is these non-linear impacts of climate change start to unfold in a way which is genuinely disturbing uh, for those of us who have watched the kind of the long, slow car crash of the climate crisis. Uh, and in particular, what happened in Australia, these pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which are essentially firestorms that are so intense, they start to generate their own weather. Um, and then obviously create highly charged clouds, which generate lightning, which then trigger more fires. So you essentially have a self seeding fire. Uh, and if you want to know what these look like, this is actually a photo from Mount Tal in the Philippines, a volcano which erupted last year. Uh, and this is not a CGI image. This is actually an image of a highly charged volcanic cloud creating its own lightning, which is what we're now seeing in these pyro cumulonimbus type effects. So I I put it to you that actually what we're telling ourselves is three comfortable myths. One, that we feel that we know what's going on and what's likely to happen in the next five to 15 years. Uh, secondly, we have a sense of control and that whatever happens, we'll find a way to tame it. Uh, and thirdly, we understand the leadership that will be required and are confident that our institutions are up to it. And I, I would put it to you that those are three very co comfortable myths. Because what we've seen in Australia is these simple linear predictable trends combining through tipping points to create complex non-linear exponential and chaotic outcomes now this is serious stuff for those of us again who have watched this agenda unfold because if you take what happened in australia it was rising temperatures it was increased drought and increased wind speeds and, and increased cuts in austerity cuts in fire and forestry services now that's important because those are all simple linear predictable trends combining through tipping points to create these rapidly converging multiple megafires, uh, which spread themselves, as I said before. And as climate scientist Michael Mann said, this is not in the models. This is not the stuff that we were anticipating happening, and certainly not something we we're anticipating happening in the immediate coming few years. And I gave a workshop uh, at the Bank of England in January this year, where we looked at these high impact but low likelihood events. Uh, and we were talking about extreme climate change and non-linear risks, but actually we also touched on pandemics and economic crises. And now we have all three at the same time. And we all know about flattening the curve in terms of COVID-19, where we're trying to bring the number of cases below the carrying capacity of the healthcare system with the protective measures like the lockdown that we're currently experiencing. Uh, but equally, you could apply the same kind of flattening the curve logic to climate change, where we're trying to use the right measures to bring uh, the shift in temperature below two degrees or towards the Paris Agreement's one and a half. And so we can also look at this in more broadly in terms of the context of sustainability, where actually we're just trying to bring all of these systems, whether it's climate change, whether it's regenerative agriculture, whether it's plastic packaging and pollution within the Earth's carrying capacity. So on the flipping of that, I would say actually what we're facing is three key uncomfortable truths. That we're facing unknown unknowns. Um, and those unknown unknowns need to be comprehended as much as is possible. The fact that we are very much not in control, and it would be actually slightly arrogant to assume that we might be. And thirdly, that leadership is just part of the mix for responsible organizing, which is why grassroots initiatives and local level activity is absolutely fundamental and should never be discounted uh, or dismissed. Because you might have also seen the headlines in the papers today about um, global aviation, we're showing that 50% of global aviation emissions come from 1% of the population and their massive frequent flying habits. But the same principle applies when you look at carbon emissions overall. It's the top 10% uh, of the world's population 
that are responsible for 49% of global emissions. So this is also not a population issue, it's a consumption issue, and it's a consumption issue in a small part of the world, which is driving the bulk of emissions. So climate change is a threat multiplier, uh, and you don't need me to tell you it's possibly the greatest risk management failure in history, because we've obviously seen this coming towards us with a grim predictability uh, for quite some time. But equally, this is not the moment to flip from going, hey, it's not real, to, okay, it's real, it's just not caused by us, to, oops, to, pardon the French, the F word, um, if there's any children out there listening, I will try not to swear. Uh, but we can't afford just to tip into that despondency. But it's not just me saying this, it's not just Greenpeace, it's not just Extinction Rebellion. Um, this is also coming from the military. So the Ministry of Defence, the highest impact, most likely strategic risk is the failure to uh, engage and mitigate on climate change. Um, and also the World Economic Forum's global risk landscape paints a very similar picture. Highest impact, highest likelihood, major strategic risk is climate change. So this is the military, this is business, uh, as well as all the campaigning NGOs that you might expect to be in this space who are giving us a very similar message. So as we said at the beginning, you know, this is an emergency uh, and we need to be treating it as such uh, and trying to engage in it. Now, remedying, obviously, this in a systemic fashion is not going to come for free. Uh, but as the dinosaurs were considering 66 million years ago, maybe the asteroid mitigation program that they were exploring at the time uh, might have been a worthwhile investment to eliminate uh, their initial demise. Because these risks are all connected. Uh, you know, and COVID-19, many people are describing as essentially a dry run for the type of disruption that we might see coming down the track towards us. We've got the economic recession having lost 20% of GDP uh, this year, which is going to be coming immediately on the back of this. Then we have the even bigger wave of climate change and perhaps the, the even more scary wave of biodiversity collapse coming along behind. So as Professor Johan Rockstrom of the Stockholm Resilience Centre says, the planet is starting to send back invoices to the economy. Everything that we do now, which is not in a place where it's starting to ameliorate these effects, is essentially another additional cost rather than an investment for the future. And we're all part of this. You know, I think we're not stuck in traffic. We are traffic. Uh, we're all very quick to point the finger of blame. But actually, we're all responsible uh, to a greater or lesser extent, and particularly in the developed world. And so we have to be accountable uh, for that responsibility, particularly in the light of historic emissions, and start to take a radical step forward into the future we need. And that's not going to be easy. Um, I've just come off a call with my colleagues at the Forward Institute, where we work on responsible leadership. And one of our faculty there, Margaret Heffernan, says the truth won't set us free until we develop the skills, the habits, the talents, but perhaps most of all, the moral courage to use that truth and to use that truth effectively. Because essentially our whole uh, world of sustainability endeavors is still a damage limitation exercise. It's only taken us closer to that central axis of the diagram here. Sustainability is about sustaining the status quo, maintaining business as usual in some way, shape or form. And actually we need to make an even more radical step into a restorative and regenerative future uh, where we're actually starting to enhance and improve the situation and that might involve removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, or perhaps regenerating, rejuvenating our ecological life support systems. So we must very much should think about sustainability as a stepping stone. It's just a transition pathway from what is a truly degenerative system into a properly, authentically regenerative one. And lots of businesses, uh, big businesses in particular, have led, uh, led the way. Uh, signing up to science-based targets. We have over 500 companies now globally trying to align their emissions portfolios and profiles with what is required uh, by the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And in many senses, that race to net zero is on. You know, no one's actually questioning the destination now, but everyone's having a huge argument about how fast we get there. Uh, and again, Extinction Rebellion and people were instrumental in framing that in the right way and saying 2040, 2050, way too late. We need to be talking about this by 2030 at the very latest. So you've seen lots of high street brands and big names uh, engaging in this. Sainsbury's is one of the more recent saying net zero by 2040, but still 20 years off. Uh, and whilst they've done great things, they've also ignored their scope three emissions, which if you know anything about scope one, two and three emissions, this is, this is the big one. 
this is their supply chain. This is where all their food and products come from. So they're kind of missing a trick. On the flip side of that, you have the ambitions and aspirations of businesses like Microsoft who are actually saying they're going to try uh, and remove all the carbon the company has emitted either directly or by electrical consumption since it was founded in 1975. Now, clearly that's ambitious. And I think we should be lauding these companies carefully because they're all seem to be engaged now in a race to the top. Although there are clearly some concerns and criticisms about how to navigate that particular net zero journey. Which brings us to the art world, because I had this quote on my office wall in the very early days of Futera back in Brixton uh, in the early noughties, uh, which said art is to the community what the dream is to the individual. Um, and we need to be trying to use the power of creative culture to share that societal dream, to actually create those positive visions of an attainable future. Because it is like a rallying cry. You know, we've gone from Lord Kitchener uh, and, you know, Uncle Sam to uh, Greta saying your planet needs you. Uh, and we need to understand that her message and the message of that Fridays for F uh, Future movement and the school children and school strikes movement is incredibly potent. It's also leading to all sorts of the right type of pester power of, of leaders uh, and, and senior people. Plus, we need to be making the landmarks here. Uh, this is the, the plaque that was put onto uh, an Icelandic glacier last summer, which is saying the Ock Glacier, um, which is the first glacier to lose its status as a glacier. And they say, in the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you in the future know if we did it. Uh, and I think these things are important because, as Naomi Klein says, Art and creativity are absolutely central to winning and sustaining people. This is going to be hard work. And we need to feed people culturally as full human beings and feed their spirits because art keeps people in movements because it gives us moments of beauty, release and community. That is the fundamental role uh, of art. And we've seen through the kind of eyes of culture declares emergency why the levers of culture are so important because culture convenes culture renews and transforms it allows us to speak differently and disrupt the status quo it builds capacities for action through inclusivity and participation and also lets us learn in this great reimagining um, and that's absolutely going to be the lodestone for how we move forward <clears throat> because some of the some of the kind of cultural resonances here are quite difficult Excuse me. Um, we're in many ways, we're hardwired uh, to see melting as a good thing. Uh, I think, you know, the symbolism of melting ice caps is, is a bit ambiguous because obviously the melting of ice tends to signify the rejuvenation of spring, the end of the winter hardship. Um, and at the same time, we're also hardwired to like the idea of growth. I mean, growing is good, but nothing should be growing infinitely so we have to play around with some of these metaphors and one of the people i turn to when i'm trying to explore the darkness of this moment and actually the grief that we're having to work our way through collectively um is joanna macy uh, who talks about this as the great turning and she said it's a dark time it's filled with suffering and uncertainty you know it's natural that we feel the trauma of the world in some way you know that's not abnormal perhaps if you're not upset and angry you're really just not paying attention so don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings the critical thing is not to turn that anger into blame but to turn it into a positive force for action and and in the great turning joanna macy talks about three different focuses of where you can be in this time one at the bottom there is obviously the shift in consciousness and values so seeing things in a perhaps the more sacred or, or spiritual lens. So learning from both new science and ancient wisdom. Then there's the holding actions, the resisting, the slowing down of the destruction. And then there's the creation of alternative structures, new patterns of organizing, new ways of doing things. Uh, and culture underpins all of that. Uh, as the management consulting guru Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, we can have every strategy we, in the world that we want, but actually, unless our culture is in support of that, and unless our culture is embracing 
those strategic changes, um, we are going to be lost. And I thought I'd include a few examples just of some of the great cultural interventions we've had. Liberate Tate has been one of uh, the most incisive. Uh, this is an arts campaigning group which has been very effective in actually removing BP sponsorship from some of our great cultural institutions, which uh, undermined their public license to operate because they use these things as a little bit of a fig leaf for some other activities. And this has included turning up and tarring and feathering um, glorious drinks parties on the terrace of Tate Modern. This is not real tar, by the way, it was molasses uh, before anyone starts to get uh, concerned. By creating art installations of bodies covered in oil within the galleries themselves, uh, by having the Reverend Billy turn up to perform an exorcism um, on, the, on the institution, uh, to my favourite, which was actually turning up to the turbine hall at Tate Modern uh, with a wind turbine blade uh, and gifting it to the uh, to the to the gallery as a as an installation. I think you can see the elegance and the cleverness and the creativity uh, and the participation that has gone into these big uh, events. They've also done other stuff, uh, uh, the National Portrait Gallery, where they read out the kind of parts per million uh, of carbon dioxide in the decades represented by the paintings in each room. This was a large sort of ensemble theatre piece within the gallery. Uh, and also, just to identify the, the kind of context of the relatively modest sum that BP was using, which is £274,000, uh, in order to get this kind of cultural kudos of association with some of our great cultural institutions. And as someone pointed out, that's about the cost of half a tooth in Damien Hirst's skull which was called, if you remember, the love for the love of God, uh, which may be your, your reaction when learning that that skull is worth 50 million pounds. Uh, and one which my colleague, the director, executive director of Greenpeace UK, John Sovan, also participated in, was people having the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere in the year they were born tattooed somewhere on their body, um, perhaps as a, a really fantastic type of symbolic marker uh, of the pace of the change. And of course, we alluded to Extinction Rebellion and the role uh, perhaps of their artistic endeavours and very much embodying, if you like, those, those, those different elements of what Joanna Macy was describing, the holding elements, the creation of new cultural possibilities and spaces uh, and the shifts in spiritual awareness and consciousness. Uh, and we saw these red brigades engaging with the Metropolitan Police um, across London during those great protests. And the power of these images is, is quite extraordinary. There's something about the silence. There's something about the connection between these officers uh, and these activists, which is quite special. And obviously it resonates with some of the most iconic historic images like this one uh, during the Vietnam War in 1967. Uh, of the students placing the marigolds down the barrels of the guns of the US National Guard. There are strong similarities across the decades of these types of actions, which is why the declaration of emergency from culture in terms of culture declares emergency has been such a critical part of the mix, if you like, of beginning uh, this process of transformation. Some of my own favorite historical examples were things like Oliver Eliasson's the weather project in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, which spoke to people, I think, of a sort of post-apocalyptic type of burning hot sun uh, and the relentless heat that might come through climate change. We've also got uh, Martin Creed's installation, the infamous lights turning on and off again, um, which, you know, in some ways uh, was not perhaps directly meant as a comment on climate change. It may not be the kind of metaphor uh, we seek to illuminate. Um, sorry, pun intended. But clearly there is something there about power cuts and about disruption to energy systems. And another one which I also think was fantastic was uh, a kind of a walkable podcast called And While London Burns, which is an operatic audio tour across the city of London, which took you through spoken word and song around a map of the institutions which are actually driving a lot of the process uh, of carbon emissions and climate change. Perhaps more playfully, uh, you have people like Mark McGowan, uh, who had a project called The Running Tap in a, in a gallery in Camberwell in South London, where I used to live. Um, he just put on a tap and ran it constantly into a sink, 
uh, during one of the biggest droughts of the early noughties in London to absolute outrage. Um, and his point was, uh, before Thames Water actually literally threatened to cut off the water to the gallery, was uh, with the leakage in their pipes, we're already wasting uh, a vast uh, volume more than he was trying to do by raising awareness of our water profligacy. Uh, Mark then uh, rather more uh, <laughs> provocatively then parked a car outside the gallery and ran uh, a hose pipe from the engine and the exhaust pipe whilst running the car uh, and filled the gallery with, with exhaust fumes. Again, making what was a rather far-sighted and ahead of his time commentary about urban air quality. Uh, again, met with outrage, but plenty of media coverage. Or Richard Box's field, uh, which is helping to make the invisible visible. Uh, these are your classic simple fluorescent tubes placed in the ground underneath uh, high energy voltage cables in, in your classic electricity pylons. And these are not plugged in. These tubes illuminate because of the electromagnetic fields being generated around those high voltage cables. So we are in many ways trying to bring the percentage and, and parts per million of a colorless, odorless gas into people's imaginations. And so we need to use these cultural ways of engaging to bring that through um, to the fore. Also about challenging use of public space. The space hijackers used to do some fantastic work in London on their circle line parties, helping people to realize and appreciate that this was our space, this was our public space, uh, and they would bring literally hundreds of people, including a samba band, onto tube carriages during rush hour uh, and create instant parties between stations uh, and then switch everything off before uh, they got to the next station. And when unwary commuters would then got on board and then as the train pulled out, the music would start up and the dancing would begin again. Um, and I think our protests can be beautiful. You know, I think the idea of clean graffiti, where we use high pressure water jets to create beautiful images against dirty concrete, um, is also very hard to prosecute because you're actually just cleaning a dirty wall. Uh, you're just partially cleaning it in a creative and beautiful fashion. Um, or we can find ways of telling powerful stories. This is Simon Starling's uh, traversing of uh, a desert in Spain uh, on, a, on a fuel cell bicycle from which he collected all the emissions, which are essentially water vapor, as you will know. Um, and then he used the water he collected to paint watercolors of the cactuses and the plant life that he saw along the way. Equally, there's plenty of stuff in the written word. Uh, one of the most visceral books I've read on the subject of uh, you know possible collapse is Cormac McCarthy's The Road, where there's a repeating motif of the fact that we are carrying the fire. Uh, and I do think we need to be thinking about this in terms of a clock of the long now because we're not going to be fixing climate change within our generation or within our children's generation. It's going to be an intergenerational challenge that we can't lose sight of. Uh, and two of the best books I read last year were The Overstory by Richard Powers, which is an absolutely profoundly beautiful book uh, about trees and our relationship with them and their relationship with the wider environmental crisis. And, and Robert McFarlane's Underland, about what lies beneath everything from deep, nuclear waste storage facilities to the fungal internet and the mycelium that unites all of the living things in our mature ecosystems uh, like old growth forests. And last but by no means least, uh, music declares emergency. Uh, you know, we need to get these guys mobilized and we're already starting to see obviously the obvious people like Radiohead, uh, but also the idols and various other musicians starting to commit to, well, no one's touring at the moment, but you know, carbon neutral touring, and very different ways of engaging uh, their audiences. And Michael Stipe, uh, former frontman of REM, also pledged the proceeds from his latest release to the Extinction Rebellion campaign. <clears throat> so to conclude, you know, we don't want this all to be dystopian. I think it's very easy for us to play satire and protest with our creative forces. But what we actually really need to be seeing, as Peter Sellers, the theatre director says, we should be at the centre of a society keeping alive a utopian vision, because society will not improve if the people envisioning it are, are, are politicians, because they will not take us out from the status quo. They will not take us and lead us away from the business as usual, which is leading us in fundamentally the wrong direction. Um, and one guy who does brilliant work on this is actually uh, a research scientist who works around renewable energy, James Mackay. You might have seen his work it comes out of the University of the Leeds, the man who draws the future. 
Uh, and I, he was brought to my attention by Rob Hopkins, the founder of Ch Transition Towns, because the pictures that James Mackay draws are actually very tangible, accessible images of familiar street scenes, but it already representing the future that we might actually need. Um, and I think they're very accessible, they're very compelling, they're very inspirational, but also they're tangible. You can start to imagine yourself in them. They're not necessarily sci-fi ridiculous. They start to look practical in terms of green spaces, uh, in terms of localized mobility, um, and in terms of electrification. And I also thought, well, we should also mention business um, because it's obviously about enterprise. Uh, I do think purpose-driven businesses mm -hmm. are going to be the ones that hopefully grow in the right way to fill the gap left in the wreckage behind some of the larger companies uh, which might break during this transition. Um, some of my favorite design work uh, is represented by people like Professor Jonathan Chapman, who talks about emotionally durable design. How do we create objects that we want to keep, that we actually build a relationship with, uh, which actually improve with age, like an old pair of jeans or the patina on a leather bag? Uh, and one of his best examples from one of his students is actually the teacup, which is only partially glazed on the inside, which means as you drink more tea, the tannins go into the ceramic and leave this beautiful pattern. So it's something which is enhanced by use, which builds a relationship to it, to the product or the object in a way that kind of completely confronts head on this idea of inbuilt obsolescence or the throwaway society. Um, equally, the Japanese art of Kintsugi, where we might bring a broken object together and in, in Kintsugi is traditionally an object is mended with gold which then makes the broken, restored object more beautiful than the original whole object. And I think as a metaphor for what we must do through the cracks which have opened up in society, this is actually a nice way of thinking about it, a kind of kintsugi for culture. Or, and again, on the durability piece, uh, there's a wonderful website called Buy Me Once, which is about loving things that last objects which are enduring. So why would you buy five saucepans over a lifetime when you should actually just try and find the money and buy the one that will see you through uh, your whole life? Uh, and I thought I'd throw in uh, a beer because everyone loves beer. Uh, you might have seen Brewdog's new initiative around Make Earth Great Again. They've embarked on a process of double offsetting all of their emissions uh, by planting uh, 22 million or 2 million trees in Scotland by 2022, trying to draw this back and saying, 2030 is too late. We're going to just go ahead and do it now. Um, and also just to show that you can tackle any challenge you want through your social enterprise if you have the gumption and the ambition. Uh, and this is Tony's Choco Lonely, which has stepped into the incredibly contentious and controversial world of West African indentured slave labor on cocoa production uh, and, and tried to make that into a populist um, and, and accessible solution by buying into slave free chocolate so it can be done we can bring our creative cultural skills into the business world um, in order to try and change the bigger picture so in many ways it can feel like we're facing breakdown it can feel like we're coming up against the barriers uh, of a very difficult challenge the solution to this is not going to be change as usual because that's just going to delay the impact of the place that we're coming to what we really need is stuff that's going to break through breakthrough into the mainstream, breakthrough into mainstream culture, and breakthrough into mainstream business. Because otherwise, if we go down the conventional route of building back better uh, or, or back to a new normal, um, it's a bit like Darth Vader saying the construction of our new Death Star is an amazing job creation opportunity. You know, yes, it is Darth, but unfortunately, it also destroys planets. So we need to embrace a more embodied way of thinking about these things, which is not just about head and logic and rationale. It's about the compassion and kindness of the heart and the, and the visceral instinctive intuition of the gut. And I think that's the way we start to unlock the resistance because I am so exhausted of hearing people say, we want to, we've got to save the planet. Uh, the planet does not want to be saved or rescued or even changed. The planet wants to be loved. It wants to be appreciated. It wants to be valued. Uh, and if we actually adopted that approach to the way that we interact with it, then we wouldn't need saving and it wouldn't need changing. It wouldn't need rescuing. And I think the Japanese, again, in the Kintsugi mold, have the, one of the best models of thinking about this. Uh, and they talk about this as a reason for being or ikigai, uh, which you may have seen before. But it, it's where you combine what you love with what you're good at, with what you could be paid for, with what the world needs. 
And there, that's the kind of the pure essence of life satisfaction. And I think we should all be striving to find our own ikigai um, wherever possible, because right now we've been in an impossible world for what feels like uh, almost a year now. Uh, and as XR have pointed out, only the impossible is interesting. We have done the impossible. We have all started working from home. We have all locked ourselves into our homes. All of things which would seem like madness, we wouldn't necessarily ever have done them voluntarily. But they've also shown that the impossible can be done. And that's why this is a brilliant rallying cry for what has to come next. Because even if, as I said, this is an intergenerational challenge, and we're not going to solve it within our particular lifetimes, it still matters because every ton of carbon that doesn't enter the atmosphere now alleviates future human suffering in some way, shape or form. So I will finish on this idea, which has actually been a thread which has run right back through to the 1960s, um, like the marigolds in the barrels of the guns of the National Guard and the anti-Vietnam protests. And it's gone through the, the pandemic and now we're going to see it in the context of climate change because essentially none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Uh, but we also have a unique opportunity at this strange and slightly bewildering moment in time for a, an amazing alignment to come together of arts, culture, environment and enterprise which could help us navigate the territory ahead in ways which are satisfying, rewarding, inspiring and game-changing. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Can you hear the round of applause? Oh, it's yeah, exactly. A bit difficult to things. It is very strange. It is very strange. I was just talking to someone earlier uh, in, a, in a workshop where we were saying, what do you miss? You say, well, I sort of miss the audience because, you know, I'm still giving a lot of talks, but... It's a very strange feeling talking to yourself in your own front room. Um, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll I can feel the warmth. I can feel the warmth. Good. Yeah, it's, it's coming coming from the far southwest. Lots of love. Um, we've got some questions in the chat, um, and my colleague Chris has been um, collating those questions, and he's now going to fire them at you in a kind of Paxman-like kind of uh, manner. Chris, is he going to ask, ask, ask the same question 13 times in a row? <laughs> until you answer it. <laughs> yeah, until I answer it. Great. Thanks, Ed. And thanks, Alistair. So, yeah, I'll just dive straight into the questions. So there's a question here about, are we seeing in a, enough climate change or climate emergency and solutions within things like fiction, TV, film? What do you think about that? Uh, no, um, there's always room for more. I mean, I, so I think there's a whole genre which is emerging called solar punk. Um, there's people starting to write sort of solar punk sci-fi um, rather than steampunk, which is obviously putting renewable energy at the front and centre of that. Um, BAFTA actually have a whole project uh, called Arthur, uh, which is all about the placement of pro-environmental behaviours uh, and actions uh, and products even into our creative industries. That's a bit too below the radar for my liking. And I think that's important in terms of some of the subliminal messaging. But I think you're right. There's still a huge opportunity for painting those better accessible positive visions of the future uh, in a way which is compelling. The trouble is dystopia tends to grab our attention more, tends to be more visceral, which is why you know people lurch towards uh, a Mad Max type of future rather than actually the attainable one that might be on the other side of, uh, of where we are now. Um, I, I, I actually gave a talk to Renault's electric vehicle conference the other week where we sang one of the most influential things that which happened in the car world was uh, an exhibition sponsored by General Motors in 1936 at the World's Fair in New York, which was called Futurama, not the cartoon. Um, and essentially what that did was planted the seeds of a car-based culture which led partly to the ripping up of public transport infrastructure, you know, zoned cities, people zooming through cities on, on large flyovers and large, large roads. And I, in, in essence, we sort of need that cultural reimagination at scale right now uh, in order to create those compelling visions of where we could be um, if we just took the next step. I think you can see all the pieces. The quotes I always use is from William Gibson, who said, 
the future's out there. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And I'm a complete geek, as I'm sure some of us are on this event. And I can I can draw you a map of where I think all the kind of elements which will be more mainstream in the future currently exist. What we haven't done is join all, all those dots together into something which people can really digest in a one-stop shop, which then takes them into a new way of thinking. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big believer of sort of imagining a more beautiful world before you can create it. So, yeah, that really yeah. ties with that. Um, Alistair, have you got a question? Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of thinking, you know, if you're going to go for one, one thing, there was so much content there, um, Ed, but, uh, you know, what's the one thing that's good this year? One thing that's good this year? It's given you hope this year in relation to action oh. on climate. Um, I think the probable death of the commute. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it's like, it's like we had this madness uh, going on where millions of us spent hours a day, you know, particularly uh, in London, but, you know, in any major city, um, often car based, trotting back and forth uh, to the office in a way that we could see, we could see the weak signal of the future and the fact that there was a bit of more degree of flexible homeworking, but the amount of accumulated waste and stress and ill health and pollution and infrastructural impact um, that was thrown at perpetuating that madness, which was an orthodoxy that we never dared to question before. Um, and I think what has given me hope is the pandemic blew that up. Um, and there's no doubt that some commuting will come back um, and people will want to go into the office perhaps one or two days a week. And I say this in the context of obviously, I know that many key workers don't have an option. They have to travel to work. If you're working in a school or a hospital, that's not an option. But for many office-based workers, um, there's a sort of insanity about it. And I think the thing that gives me hope is, you know, you've you've had that disruption of the status quo, which probably won't come back at the same scale uh, and will have huge amounts of positive benefits uh, for everyone as a result. Thank you, Ed. That is, uh, I think, the perfect segue onto the next bit of content. So um, I'm going to thank you for your contribution, bringing your voice to Plymouth and those people that dial into the stuff that's going on Plymouth side. Um, uh, it has been true inspiration. Um, so thank you for your time. I hope you'll be joining us. I'm going to go and pick up my daughter. Of... I'm going to go and pick up my daughter from school, unfortunately. So uh, I will have to say goodbye. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the rest Maybe of the day. Thanks, Ed.